It doesn't have quite the same status as joining the Man City Academy or becoming the next oasis, but in these parts, sewing is definitely gaining street cred. Haywood, near Manchester, is an industrial community where eyebrows would normally be raised if a boy mentioned he'd been tacking or ironing. But a textile revolution is going on at the Haywood Community High School, and it's being led by former interior designer Stella O'Toole. In a school with a wide range of abilities and aspirations, textiles is becoming one of the most popular subjects for girls and boys. Pupils are discovering a creativity that boosts self-esteem and gives them something to take to the school disco. Certainly I would never probably make a pencil case again in my life because I kind of find it quite dull and um, perhaps not challenging enough for some of the students that we have in this school. Um, but I know for, for certain that a lot of schools are still doing things like that and I think it's just kind of thinking a bit further and saying what would these kids actually like? You know, what would they like to take home with them? The answer she came up with was bags and hats and computer-generated designs. Before Stella arrived, the textiles course had become moribund because of long-term illness. Almost overnight, the subject became exciting and absorbing. The first three years in secondary school, they have to do textiles. And do they protest? No. Um, I would say less so this year than last year, and I think it's... Um, I think it's developed, people have, you know, the reputation develops that we are doing fun projects in here and it's not just for girls and, you know, there are interesting projects that boys equally will like as much as girls and I think that's changed a lot of people's opinions within the school and the students particularly. Everyone says it's for girls but it's not. Why? Why do they say it's for girls? Because in the old times, girls used to do sewing and, that, and boys didn't. But um, if the boys get to know how fun it is, this is Stella's second year as a teacher, a new career that started with near disaster. An arson attack wrecked part of the technology department and ruined the textiles room at the beginning of her first term. It happened two weeks before our annual open evening. Now the open evening for a school is when you um, put your best foot forward and show off um, yourselves to prospective parents. It happened on the Friday night. We arrived in school on the Monday morning and we're like, uh, it was awful. It was really, really awful. And it was amazing the work that was done and the difference that was made within that fortnight. Um, and Stella's room went from like being a really grimy, smoky, smelly, awful, awful place to well, what I said on the night was like the best, the best room in the school. And it was, it was full of like children's work our own work and it looks stunning, it looked really, really good. The frustration of having students' work destroyed, um, I guess, pushed me a lot further to try and resource things. I mean, we had nothing. But yeah, I, I guess a challenge for me is a good thing. I like to be challenged and I just kind of see it as another hurdle to leap over. When Stella focused her mind on where to find fresh stocks of material, she started thinking rubbish. I actually got the idea to go um, after recycled material, basically from my own industrial experience. Um, when I worked at, um, in London as an interior designer, I often resourced things through recycle banks. Um, I actually specialise in mosaicing, and recycle banks are actually the best place to get things like broken tiles and broken ceramics. Um, and I linked in from kind of that knowledge over here and kind of thought, well, there must be similar things over in Manchester that we can actually use. And obviously they were, they were in abundance, so. A look in Yellow Pages led her to the local authority recycling department, and from there she was directed here, a Rochdale textiles firm desperate to give away waste material. There's three or four schools now who collect from us, but Stella has been the most reliable in terms of developing usage of that waste, and we have contacted other colleges now, and there's quite a major project on the go to, to recycle more fabrics. Uh, so we're happy to see that happening. It would have gone into the waste skips, would have gone to landfill. Um, and would cost us money to clear it. So it's a, it's a win for everybody, this, and everybody wins. So we can make th things out of the waste fabric, and we're saving money on waste collection. So it's something we'd love to do more of. That's what we've been making this week, as you know. Well, these would be ideal, these ones. I think yep. you'll get a good selection there. Definitely. Be as creative yep. as you were yep. before. Look forward to seeing the end results. Yep.
So anything useful there? Definitely. Um, this is just a sample of what we actually took today. Um, certainly this type of stuff is quite interesting. We are, as part of the national curriculum now, supposed to do smart fabrics and look at um, properties of fabric that are used in technology. Um, and certainly this one, um, with waterproofing, is going to be something that we can use and perhaps try and think of a project. We're actually thinking of making some kites. Uh, the fur is going to be ideal as well. I've actually got quite a lot of students in year 10 that are thinking of doing um, things like bean bags. Um, I've got one that's making a dog basket, which could be quite interesting. So I think the fur would be really nice for that as well. Parents are also an important source of materials, especially if they own a rope factory. Stella made this useful discovery when she told a pupil he was using too much cord while making a bag. We were actually making the bags in year nine um, and he was cutting out his cord and I was saying be careful, you know, measure it out because it's very, very expensive. And he said, oh, my dad makes that, does he now? And I think it kind of stemmed from there that I'm, I think I'm probably known as a bit of a scrounger and very resourceful and I kind of said, well, do you think he would donate any? Um, and he said, I'll ask him, I'll ask my dad and it kind of stemmed from there. So we've been very, very lucky with that. OK, thanks very much. See you again. Stella now collects enough cord to last her all year. What difference has it made to you getting all this free material? Um, I think, I mean, I've got this little display here of bags that my um, now Year 11 made last year. Um, and certainly from my point of view, um, suede, I just could never have afforded it. And the quality of these bags, just based on the actual material itself, um, has made such a big difference to the teaching that I can do in the school. Um, most schools, I'm sure, have very limited budgets. I don't think we're an exception to that rule. And I just think to be able to produce something like that raises the profile of the subject, but also um, a student's kind of self-esteem. To produce something that gorgeous out of a piece of scrap fabric is really an achievement. Um, and again, it's just something that I think is, is the way forward for any school. We just don't have the money anymore, and you have to be very, very resourceful and get the stuff from wherever you can. Um, so I think it's a great thing, and I think more schools should do it. You know, environmental issues are part of the national curriculum now, not only in technology, but across the board, and I think we should be more proactive about doing it. At the end of the day, we all have a responsibility to the environment. And I would much rather see this going on somebody's shoulder down a nightclub than into a landfill site, and that's the bottom line. And I think more subjects could be doing this, not just technology. There's lots of other resources available that could be used elsewhere in a school. For example? Paper, plastics. Um, I mean, we've seen all sorts. You know, when I've been to Recycle Bank before, um, a lot of art material, paint, you know, there's, it just depends where you go and what they've had on any given day. You never know what you're going to find in there. This is Stella's third career after leaving school and working in a bank and then gaining a degree and becoming an interior designer, changing rooms for rich clients in London and the home counties. Trying not to sound too much like a Department of Education recruitment ad, Stella explained that she wanted more out of life and found it in Tower Hamlets. A lot of people are in a, what I would class as a privileged position, particularly in London. People forget that there are people other than self, you know, and you, I think it's important to get involved with things, voluntary stuff particularly. Uh, where you can help other people and maybe make some kind of difference with that. Um, so I actually first registered with their Reading Partners Scheme in Tower Hamlets, uh, which is a very poor area in the east end of London, uh, where literacy, particularly in primary schools, is extremely low. Um, and you actually get allocated one child, which you'll maybe go in once a week to actually read with that child and try and encourage them to develop their reading and, and speaking skills. Um, I guess it just developed from there. Um, when you have a child waiting for you at the school gate, so excited that they're actually going to get some one-on-one -on -one attention and they feel very, um, it kind of changed the girl I was working with, you know, she, she kind of changed from this little mousy thing to this bright, bubbly, um, exuberant child, you know, and I, I just found that amazing that you could make such a big difference just by such a small gesture. Um, and then when I actually left London, I went to Australia and I worked with two um, students that had actually been excluded from school. One was in Sydney and one was in Perth. Um, and again, I found that extremely rewarding. And I, I guess things just progressed from there. I'd kind of always toyed with the idea of teaching. Um, and that really was the final thing for me. I just wanted a year out of this country to really assess myself and, and decide whether it's what I wanted to do. And 
I'm glad I did, you know, it's been the best decision I've ever made. Stella went to Manchester Metropolitan to train and Moss Side for a teaching practice and developed a liking for areas of dark satanic mills. I certainly would say to anyone who was contemplating um, leaving university, whether to go into a nice grammar school or an inner city school, to go and have a look, go and see what the kids are like and how enthusiastic they are. They're almost at bursting point, you know. They just want somewhere to outlet all the energy and all the enthusiasm. And if you're a teacher that can help them do that, then you're never going to have any problems. Um, because they just keep on going, you know. They just want more. And I think if you're enthusiastic, they will take that from you and they will, you know, develop that further. Personally, I don't th I actually think necessarily that an inner city school classroom is any harder to control than a, a countryside classroom or a privileged area classroom. I think all classrooms have behavioural issues or management strategies required to actually be able to teach effectively. Um, and I think it's a stereotype to assume that an inner city school is necessarily bad and badly behaved. Um, I certainly think that there are different challenges within an inner city school. Um, but I think if you are clear on boundaries and set clear boundaries in terms of what is um, appropriate in terms of respect for one another, in terms of what is appropriate classroom behaviour uh, and what is inappropriate, then students are very clear and can work within those boundaries. For the first time in the history of education in Haywood, three boys have opted to take textiles to GCSE. I was delighted. Um, when I actually had three boys opt for textiles this year, we were counting through the slips. They have like a paper slip to decide their option. And I was going through them all hoping. Um, and I was delighted. I knew one boy was definitely going to take it, but I was amazed that there was three. And I think in a school where no one has taken textiles this year at GCSE, clearly that, that takes a strong character to say, well, actually, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm a boy and I don't care. I'm going to do textiles. I really want to have a go at that. What's so special about textiles? Uh, I just think making different kinds of clothing and using different types of fabrics. Um, like with woodwork and metal work, you just use like the same wood and the same metal, but in textiles you get to use like different fabrics, like wool, cotton and stuff like that, and different types of sewing and using the machines and stuff like that. What's the worst part of textiles as a subject? Threading a needle? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Were your family surprised when you decided to take textiles? Just started laughing, just told them to shut up. I think it's really um, down to the way she works with all students, not just the boys. The fact that she's, she's clear about what she wants in the lesson. Um, her lessons are well planned, they've got lots of variety in them, and that everybody sees the success uh, at the end of the lesson, boys or girls. So obviously it gets people enthused, and the boys particularly seem to be doing really well. But Stella's not satisfied with the transformation she's achieved so far. She won't be entirely happy until there's sexual equality in her classroom and textiles has become totally cool. If I came back to see year 11 in a few years' time, say two years' time, how many boys will there be? I would hope it was half and half. That would be ideal. Is it realistic? Who knows? I mean, it's, it's a difficult question. I think um, that is the aim. Whether we achieve that or not remains to be seen. But as I say, we're trying. Um, and it's ongoing at the moment. Okay.